And lastly, we have to enhance the capabilities and motivation of the therapist to do the treatment. So the basic principle in DBT is if you're not capable of doing the treatment, if you're not motivated to do the treatment, then what's the point of, it, of doing any of this? You're just going to have therapists dropping off the team, falling off the model, etc. So in DBT, what you're required, when, when I go out and do training and people say, what do I have to have to have comprehensive DBT? What I say is you have to have met these five functions. It's not critical that you had those specific modes. What matters is that you've accomplished these functions. So let me just give you some examples. So this is standard adult DBT. Um, so the functions are on the left and the um, modes are on the right. So in a standard DBT program, client capabilities, uh, or the lack thereof, is treated with the skills training group. Motivation is treated with individual therapy. Generalization with phone consultation. Structuring the environment is the individual therapist either during or out of session. Um, and therapist capability motivation by consultation team. If you look at an adolescent, this is sort of standard adolescent model, which is, I was just discussing with Sarah. It's important to know there are no randomized controlled trials for DBT in adolescents, even though it's getting disseminated like nobody's business. There's actually no RCTs for kids. Um, there's a non-randomized controlled trial that has nice results, but it's not randomized. So just make sure that we, we don't have misinformation, because I sure hear lots of people thinking there's more data than there is. There is a, a trial for teenagers in Norway in progress. And Marsha just applied with Elizabeth McCauley to NIMH to do a trial here at the Children's Outpatient Clinic. Um, we'll see whether it gets funded. Uh, so standard DBT for kids involves a multifamily group. So that is the parent and child or some other guardian and child are coming to group skills group together so that you're having more of an impact on the environment at home, improve the chance of generalization of the skills. Uh, then client motivation is still with individual therapy. Generalization is phone consultation. But the parents are also practicing their, the skills themselves at home. So when, you, when the parent comes to skills group, it is not to say, here's how I'll coach my kid to use this skill. They have to go home and do their own homework using the skill for their own self. And, uh, but that has a big generalization actually impact on the kids. So they're modeling it um, and they're also uh, structuring the environment because they're a little less out of control themselves. Um, so the structuring environment is the same in terms of in the individual therapist during and out of sessions, but it's often the case that a DBT adolescent therapist might do an hour of individual treatment, 40 minutes with the kid, 20 minutes with the kid and the parent. So like bringing in the parent at the end of the session, for instance, or having a session every second or third week with the, the kid and the family, um, which would be about structuring the environment. And then their capabilities really constantly. Um, this is my, in, this member at FIT would be an integrated, but this is as of five years ago, I'm out of date on FIT. So God knows if this is true now, but when I was working with the FIT team, uh, with the, actually with prime time is who I was working with, uh, but doing similar intervention. Uh, so the client capabilities, uh, so essentially the basic principle at the time was the structuring the environment and the therapist motivation piece was, was, we were using MST for that. That's what MST already has, that's what it's set up to do. The, uh, the cons because MST is really designed to affect the environment of the kit, right? And DBT is really the opposite. DBT is really designed to affect the environment of the kid by affecting the kid, as opposed to primarily affecting the environment. And the alliance is primarily with the kid instead of the environment. So that piece was already there. And what we were trying to do is do some things to kind of deal with these emotionally dysregulated kids who wouldn't, once you get their environment together, wouldn't naturally sort of reboot themselves like many other MST kids would. And so the idea was to bring in some strategies that were kid-specific, um, to see if that would um, improve things. So DBT skills are taught to the kid. Um, often in our FIT system, they're already being taught to them at JRA before they arrive in FIT. Uh, and they can be taught to the family in the home. Um, client motivation, the chain analysis and validation pieces from DBT were kind of brought in to kind of strengthen uh, that piece of it. And uh, generalization was a lot of, MST is a lot of phone generalization in general, uh, but also parents practicing skills. Uh, 
in a residential setting, um, client capabilities, like in Connecticut, mostly what we've got is the, the, in the inpatient unit, the juvenile justice, residentials, whatever. The skills are still being done in skills training. I can't recommend a group enough as long as you don't have a whole bunch of all the issues of deviant kids talking to deviant kids. But you just have to decide what your setting is exactly like. And the fact that it runs much more like a class than a group helps. You mostly have to worry about what happens before it breaks and after. Um, the motivation is both in a facility, you've got a lot of people to follow a behavior mod plan that would not exist in an outpatient environment. So the client motivation is not only individual therapy, but the, whatever behavior mod plan is being put in place, is those meet the function together. Uh, generalization is coaching by the therapist and the floor staff, so there's not a need for one player to be the primary coach in that environment that's not using the strengths of that system. They've got coaches everywhere they look, so they should have coaching everywhere they go um, within the facility. So that's what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, structuring the environment, the primary therapist with social work, the sh uh, presenting information at shift change, uh, plus any family, DCF in child and family services, depending on what state you're in, they call it something else. Uh, that sort of thing, where you're working with DCF workers perhaps to try to um, facilitate access to parents when that really is the thing that is the primary reinforcer for the kid and you can't get access to the, the parent no matter what you do because the DCF people get in the middle of it even though the kid is shaped up, then you may be working directly with DCF to say, okay, we got to come up with a plan because you are completely punishing this kid. For, you know, even, even though this kid's shaping up like crazy, no, lack of access is just killing me here. So can we get some access on that? Um, and then uh, again, uh, therapist capability is treated in consultation meetings, which, and I'll come back to this, are so, sometimes that is the team meeting, but often in a residential setting, team meetings have other functions and you actually end up with a separate consultation team. Uh, acute inpatient, uh, people often say, what about doing this when you've got them for just a week? Um, in that case, really the main thing that I don't know, if, I don't think I had time to kind of put together the targets for this, but essentially the basic idea is that you're trying to shift it from really trying to create underlying change, which is what we see with people who are in longer term residential facilities, to what we usually call in DBT just community rent. We want them just enough able to go back to the community and then we're going to move on. So usually they only teach a subset of the DBT skills. So usually some combination of the crisis survival skills, opposite action, um, sometimes dear man, um, just a very small subset so that the kids, you know, when I've seen people try to teach everything in a short stay, which just confuses the kids and everybody. You're better off shrinking the subset of skills down until it fits for what the kid or the, the adult client can actually learn in the window of time you have to give them. Um, again, the rest of it looks very similar to other, um, to other programs, except again, the coaching, you're really going to want to hone in on a few skills and not have all the staff going off on eight different tangents. Because if you have them only for a short time, you've got to be able to get everybody to focus on the same skills, or this really tends to go there. Elephant basket, um, in my experience. So, what are some key elements of DBT? So this is a kind of list of elements that I think are kind of above and beyond what uh, a lot of other CBT interventions that people are familiar with do. Um, I do want to say, essentially, DBT is radical behavior therapy. So, if you know radical behavior therapy, contingency management, other interventions that are not very cognitive, primarily behaviorally oriented, then you know a huge amount of DBT already. Um, the, uh, what I'm going to emphasize are things, emphasize things that are unique elements in, that I think are crucial, but we don't know yet empirically what's crucial. So the closest we've gotten is a, is a component analysis of skills versus no skills versus the whole treatment, and the data's not done with that trial yet. And we're going to be inching our way toward other component analysis. It's just a huge, time-consuming, not very, NIMH is not very interested in funding process. So I think we're going to have to wing it a lot, because I don't think we're going to um, be able to figure some of the stuff out. 